Here we go. I got the right place. So let us begin with our prelude from Barbara. And what's the name of it, Barbara? You are mine. You are mine. Take it away. Thank you. Good piano. That's fantastic. Thank you, Barbara. Let us continue now with our call to worship as it's found in your bulletin. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually be in my mouth. The soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Amen. Now, Jeff will lead us in our first hymn, Wonderful Words of Life. Hey, Jeff. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life, offer pardon and peace to all, Wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Thank you, Jeff. Now let us continue in a spirit of prayer as we join in our congregational prayer together, saying, O oh Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man, we come to you as our intercessor with Father God. 
a high priest who holds the time forever. O Lord, we are merely human, prone in these bodies to sin against God and in need of one to pray for us for our forgiveness. O Lord, there were many appointed in the earth before you came for us, died for us, and rose again to eternal life for us, and are available to all for all of time. O Lord, we pray for your gift of grace in our lives, your free gift of salvation and redemption. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in all our troubles and sins, and for the gift of your presence forever. It is in Jesus' name we give thanks always. Amen. And as we continue in a spirit of prayer, I would ask, as I usually do, if there are any that we need to add to our prayer list this week. Yes, Dennis. Oh, I lost it. Get this thing out of here. And what was the, the granddaughter's name again? Isabel. Jeannie. Really? Wow. Yeah, right. So the staff can st still considers to be an issue with. Okay. Um, Janet, can you mute, please? Mute. Want me to mute? Yes, please. Your, um, you're interfering a little bit with the recording. Are there others? Amen. Ed, John, and Joyce. Those people that have been away all summer. <laughs> it's good to see you all. <laughs> well, we'll take bad pennies if you want. To, if you want to consider yourself one, uh, we certainly don't. Um, if that's all, then uh, we will continue in a spirit of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit to unite us as one under your fatherhood. We thank you that you have sent your son to be one of our brothers among many in this world. We thank you for your care for us and your care for those that are in our sphere of influence and within our sphere of knowledge. We especially pray for all of those that appear on our list, for the various ones that are dealing with illness, 
We pray especially this morning for those three disabled persons in our area who have succumbed to COVID in the past week or so. We pray for all of those that are in uh, care facilities for the disabled in our area. We ask that you would strengthen the staff that we have, that you would uh, find a way to bring more into the fold. We ask that you would uh, protect those who are in those facilities. We pray, Lord, for Melissa and for Isabel, who were raised by Dennis this morning for upcoming surgeries and um, and we praise and thank you that uh, your presence will be with them as they face their challenges in the near future. And we pray for their complete healing from all of that. And we praise you, Lord, for, um, for the return of, uh, of Ed and John and Joyce to be with us this morning. We thank you for being with them while they were away. And we ask for your strength and joy to be with them as they have rejoined us. We thank you and praise you for all of the ways that you continue to be our God, to be our savior and redeemer, and continue to be our strength in, the whole, in your Holy Spirit. And we thank you that uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus has taught us to pray. So we join in that prayer that he taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And as we continue with our worship this morning, I invite Jeff to share uh, an offertory with us. How great thou art, 
how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. How great thou art. Now I will invite Cheryl to come now and to share the gospel with us. Good morning. I'll be reading out of the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So, throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see you again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him all the way. May we hear in these words the words of the Lord. And once again, we'll do the worship shuffle here and invite Jeff back for the uh, second hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Mortals join the mighty chorus with the morning stars began. Love divine in reigning o'er us, binding all within its span. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. A uh, little Beethoven for us this morning. Amen. So today, we're going to look at the last chapter of Job. And we see Job, that man of integrity, acknowledging his lack of understanding of who God is. In verse two and three, he quotes God's questions to him and reacts with wonder and a clear vision of the nature of God. In the verses between the opening statements of the chapter and Job's restoration, we learn that God is displeased with the three friends of Job 
who questioned God's work and Job's life and find that Job can turn the tables on them and offer to intercede with God for their forgiveness. And when Job does this, he himself is restored. It is Job's obedience to act as intercessor that allows his own restoration. And I find two things interesting about that restoration, that only the daughters of his new life are mentioned by name, and that they are given an equal share of his wealth with the sons. Rather unique situation in the Old Testament. So just maybe there is some light for the women of the world, even in the Old Testament. Here then is our final reading in the book of Job for this time around in the common lectionary, taking from Job 42 verses one through six, and then skipping over to verses 10 through 17. Those verses we're skipping are the intercession with God of the um, four, the three friends. So then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is it that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, he quotes the Lord again. I will question you and you declare to me. And Job answers, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now skipping over to verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. Can you imagine all the feed for those animals? He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, meaning dove. The second Keziah, meaning Kasha or cinnamon. And the third Karen Hapak, meaning horn of eye cosmetic. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days.
The sermon this morning is called, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. Job had certainly endured his share of unjust suffering, as the world might put it, or at least undeserved suffering as we might see it today. Here was a man who had done nothing wrong, who had obeyed God in all things, yet lost everything he had of wealth and homes and family, and then suffered with boils all over his body for many years. And all through this, he continued to bless and seek the Lord. He continued to believe in God, even when God seemed so far away, when darkness seemed to be the norm for him. When deliverance was hidden from his eyes and there was no light at the edge of the horizon, no hint of a brilliant sun about to disperse the gloom, his so-called friends had added to his physical torture with their insistence that Job was not really a friend of God because well, how could he be if he was suffering so? Would a good God allow such suffering if it wasn't deserved? Job was getting it from all sides. Yet he stuck by his God. Now I'm hard pressed to think of a time in my own life that I was suffering some disease or consequence that I didn't deserve. I am a sinner, a liar, a rebel, a hater of other people sometimes, which would classify me as a murderer in the eyes of Jesus. I've used the Lord's name in ways of which I am ashamed. I can't think of a commandment I haven't broken. And if I look hard enough, I can find times that I have paid the price for those sins. There are lessons I've learned along the way that have molded me into who and what I am today. But among those sufferings that I know I deserve, I can think of two that I don't think I earn. And those are my heart attack and the sale of my house, which are closely related. Now, when I was young and in rebellion during my teen years, I took up the bad habit of smoking. I smoked everything legal everything I could get my hands on that I could inhale that wouldn't get me prison time. And the more I did that, the worse I felt physically. My breathing began to be affected. My endurance waned. I woke up coughing every morning. And no matter how much I brushed my teeth or sucked on mints, there was a bitter taste in my mouth and breath that was not attractive to anyone within miles of me. So eventually around the age of 32, after smoking all those years, I gave it up. Now they say that the body will begin to mend itself and within a year or so, be flushed of all the poisons you've put in through smoking and be back to the way it was created by God to be. And I felt good after I quit and better every day as time passed. 
the danger that I was in while an active smoker was diminished to the point of being in the same risk as anyone who never smoked. And about a month before my 43rd birthday, bam, a severe heart attack. Where did that come from? I had quit almost 11 years before. And I had quit to avoid just such ramifications. So why me? Why now, Lord? But that brief moment when the blood flow to my heart, to my heart stopped, my heart from beating, began a long road to recovery. That brief moment sapped my strength and forced a long period set aside that removed me from all the things in life to which I had become accustomed. It took away my ability to work and make money to pay my bills. In those days, it took two incomes to keep current on everything we needed to pay. But thankfully, my wife had a career that could expand on opportunities to increase our income, especially when we needed it. And when I couldn't work, she was able to take on more hours, for a while, 16 hours every day which included an extra job that could stretch our ability to meet the bills while I was incapacitated. I had no choice but to rely on her income only. I thanked God all the time that he had given us the ability to adjust to the circumstances that were forced on us. Even though I felt inadequate and unproductive, I needed the time to recover. And I'm sure that during those months, I drew closer to God as I sought out reasons for my situation and relied on God to supply our needs. And then, in the very midst of my recovery, my wife was suddenly laid off from one of her jobs when the nursing home closed its doors and our income was cut in half. Oh God, I thought, where are you now? Why have you abandoned us? In the early days of my recovery, while she was still fully employed, I wasn't even sure that I would continue to gain strength at all. I thought that even though I had survived the initial heart attack and returned home, I was so weak that there was no way I was going to live much longer. And a lot of my thoughts turned heavenward and longed for that eternal rest with the Lord. But as I did gain strength and confidence with it, that I might actually be able to live and serve the Lord a while longer, we were hit with this sudden income loss. Another job didn't seem to be available to her and I was nowhere near ready to work to supply that income. We searched for ways to put food on the table and supplement our income with state programs to help. But there was no help there. And the church even was not able to help much with our need. We were not without income long enough to meet the requirements of the state programs, which could be supportive 
if we could tap into them. We still had the house. And as long as we did have that and the cars that could get us to potential job sites, we were too well off to qualify for aid. The mortgage company would only work with us for so long to enable us to keep the property and then became unwilling and unyielding to the point of returning a payment to us that was one day late. It appeared they would rather have nothing in the form of payment from us then work to keep us as a customer and receive the rest of the payments when this bump in the road had been smoothed over and we were able to reestablish our lives. It seemed at the time their only goal was to take the house and recover what they could with its sale to someone more able to pay now. That's when we decided we had to sell it. As Job said in the middle of his sufferings, oh, that I knew where I might find you, Lord. Now I thanked God for delivering me from my medical trauma, but I am sure that I questioned his presence in my financial woes. Why have you spared my life only to lose what I have been given in your mercy? The property we have used to glorify you, to help others who needed our help in their times of struggle. But a question is not the same as a denial. I couldn't refuse to believe God because I struggled in the world. I couldn't lose sight of God in the midst of my own perceived losses. Even though I didn't understand what was going on, I couldn't sacrifice my faith in God who had brought me through so much. As long as I was alive in this body, I had to believe in God's goodness. I still believe. And I am thankful and happy in God to this day. My struggles did not last the rest of my life. As stressful as they were in my weakness, they did not lead to the eternity I was so sure would come in the early days of my recovery. God sustained me and strengthened me through it all. Even though I may have thought I didn't deserve what I was getting in those trials, I am grateful that God was there in the darkness. I can bless the Lord all the days that remain for me. God did show up in those days and delivered us from our obligations to the bank with a buyer for the house. Before the bank moved in to take it, It was their intransigence and unwillingness to work with us that caused us to have to sell. And we had made improvements on that house that allowed us to get more money for it than what we paid for it. But the difference didn't cover the full cost of the loan we had. 
and the bank forfeited a portion of that loan to allow the sale to take place. The financial woes continued with the IRS. When they informed us that the mortgage company's forfeiture should have been reported on our taxes as income to us that year and billed us for the extra in addition to the capital gains tax on the difference between the purchase and sale price of the house. That year also marked the first of some stimulus payments offered by the government to help the less fortunate weather the downturn in the economy at the time. Though we never, those we never received, though we certainly needed them, because the IRS made sure to take them to satisfy the delinquent taxes they imposed on our loss. Woe upon woe. But thankfully, God was there to lift us with that sale and to keep us fed during all that time. That was also at this time of being set aside from the world that I wrote my Easter cantata, which I called, It Took a Miracle. I had a lot of time to do nothing at that time, but think about God and praise him in my music. It was a great time for praising God in the middle of my troubles. Forced to face my own mortality, I was able to reach out to God in my weakness. And that gave me more of an appreciation for God's strength. He could have called me home when my heart was interrupted in its rhythm when a portion of it ceased to function at all. But God's strength was with me. How could I not praise him? How could I not bless God with all I am and all I have? Jesus tells us that in the world, you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. That's John 16, 33, if you want to look it up. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, indeed. Amen. So now I, I would invite Jeff one, once more to share, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its words. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who each in sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me.
Amen. Jesus loved us even before we were ready to love him. Amen. Let us join now in our congregational prayer for renewal as it's printed in your bulletin. As we say together, O oh Lord, our God, we come to you in faith, for how else can we approach you? Your presence with us is only known as we trust in your provision for us, as we accept all things from your hand. Restore our faith in you as we accept that all things come from you. Help us to perceive, O oh Lord, that what seems bad to us in our experience may have a benefit for someone else and give us the strength to endure that what seems extreme to us can be managed with your presence as we trust in you. For even our very lives are your gift to us and our days are numbered from the beginning of them. Give us the confidence to trust that you will carry out all your plans for us. In the name of your precious only Son, who died for us, we pray. Amen. And now may the God who dwells in heaven above and Christ who reigns within there and the Holy Spirit that he sent to be our connection. Be with you now and forevermore as we go forth and spread the good news of his presence with us. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara.